Okay, hello everyone. Hopefully you can hear me, see me. Um, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Mike Noel. I am the Governmental Affairs Manager for TAMRA in North America. Uh, I get to work on public policy related to the circular economy, including container deposit systems. Uh, I'm based here in beautiful Connecticut at our North American headquarters. Um, and today we're going to be discussing best practices in container deposit return systems, how to design them to be convenient. Um, and I think it's going to be a good discussion. Before we get into it, a few housekeeping items so you know how to uh, participate in today's event. Um, you've joined in listen only mode. You can ask questions at any time using the control panel, um, using the chat and Q&A function there. Um, we will send out a recording of today's sessions afterwards, um, and there'll be a survey afterwards that you can take. Um, we'd appreciate your input on that. Um, and the slides will be available. Uh, we'll post them on tomber.com. Okay, with that out of the way, allow me to introduce our presenters. Next slide, please. Great, so up first, you have this uh, very serious looking gentleman on the left here and uh, in the middle, Filippo, and on the right, Katrine. Um, Filippo, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course, thank you very much, Mike. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Filippo Montalbetti. I'm Vice President Governmental Affairs Central Europe. I'm located in a very charming Vienna, a bit rainy today, though, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. So over to you, Katrine. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. So, hi everyone. I'm also very excited to present to all of you today from, I think, all around the globe. My name is Katrin Bjolan, and I work as a senior business development manager in Tomer Collections. I'm based at our headquarter in Norway, which today is quite chilly and rainy as well. Excellent. Um, great. Well, we brought this panel of global experts together uh, because we wanted to illustrate how container deposit systems are different around the world and how when you look at those high performing systems, um, those that are most effective, there's actually quite a pattern of success there. Uh, and so we're hoping, you know, Filippo from Vienna, uh, Katrine from Norway can help sh uh, share this global perspective for our audience today. Um, and next slide. Here is our agenda. We'll provide an introduction to Tamra, just so you understand where we're coming from. Uh, and then we'll be talking about convenience in the context of a deposit system. What does it mean? How can you measure it? And making container return accessible, uh, including describing why the high performing systems choose what is known as a return to retail model. And making container return easy. What are the different redemption solutions that are out there, the different technologies that make container return easy, uh, including describing how they differ from one another. And uh, we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A. Um, and next slide. For an introduction to Tamra, um, we are known for pioneering uh, advanced technology in collection and sorting for recycling. We do this through two main divisions. Tamra Collection on the left, uh, provides a range of services and technology specifically for these container deposit return systems. Um, and on the right, Tamra Sorting provides um, advanced sensor-based solutions specifically for the recycling, mining, and food industries to maximize resource productivity. Tamra Sorting's advanced optical sorting and robotics equipment is favored by state-of-the-art material recycling facilities and the waste management industry around the world. Tamra employs over 4,300 people, uh, and we operate in over 100 countries. Next slide. And last year, we were excited to launch Tamra Circular Economy. This is an in-house innovation accelerator that partners with internal and external experts to really better understand and solve for the challenges to accelerating the transition to a circular economy. What does it take to really bring us there in reality, and, and how, can we, how can we bring that to scale? Um, so the group's mission is bold. It's designed to explore disruptive business models, disruptive technologies, and uh, how to digitalize the uh, resource value chain. So if this is something of interest for you, feel free to reach out. We're always looking for new connections and, and ideas uh, to bring to scale. Next slide. So when it comes to container deposit return systems, Tamra has nearly five decades of experience in this specific field of collection for recycling. 
Uh, that includes being involved in uh, every major global deposit market, like the, the high performing systems out there, like Norway, Germany, Michigan, et cetera. Um, and every year we collect over 40 billion cans and bottles. Uh, next slide. And for those of you who are new to deposit return systems, just to make sure we're all on the same page here, deposit systems are known for incentivizing recycling. And they do that by giving waste a value. In a deposit system, a used beverage container has a monetary value. And that makes it far more likely the public is to uh, return it for recycling rather than littering it or throwing it away. Next slide. And this is how it works at the, the most basic level. A consumer will uh, pay for the price of a beverage and on top of that, a small but meaningful deposit. And then they can return it to a retailer or sometimes a uh, independent recycling location where they get their deposit money back in full. Um, and then uh, finally, the beverage industry in some shape or form is responsible for picking up the container and recycling it. Um, so those of us in the field know there's a number of different steps here and different financial flows depending on the system's design, um, but this is how it works at the most basic level. Next slide. And it turns out that this is an extremely effective mechanism for changing consumer behavior. Um, they're very effective at capturing items for recycling. Um, in fact, by placing a deposit on a container, it makes it two to four times more likely the container will be recycled based on US and European data. Um, so for example, on the left, this chart here uh, shows uh, across Europe, on average, 47% of containers without a deposit are collected for recycling versus 94% of containers with a deposit. So it's twice as effective to place a deposit on the container for it to be recycled. Um, and the impacts are even more extreme uh, and impactful in the US on the right here. Um, so it's an intervention. It's a public intervention to uh, collect items for recycling rather than littering and or uh, disposal, keeping items in that continual resource loop. Next slide. Yet what we see is not all deposit return systems are reaching their potential. This chart shows the 40 something deposit systems in existence today. They're already up and running. Um, and you can see there's a range of performance. Uh, so on the left, you have Germany, the world leader collecting 98% of all deposit containers, a near perfect system when it comes to collection. Um, and then on the right, you have Massachusetts and Connecticut, which collect 50% of all deposit beverages sold. Um, so even in Massachusetts and Connecticut, these systems are performing above the non-collection, non-deposit collection systems performance. Um, but clearly when we're talking about deposit systems, there's really just, there's more room for improvement there. They are known for achieving these superior collection rates. Um, and so at Tamra, given we're involved in these systems, we operate here uh, and we see a uh, great interest in deposit systems around the world, we wanted to better understand what are these high performing systems doing right? And uh, how can these other systems learn from them? How can the new systems coming online learn from these high performers? Um, and next slide. We spent about a year uh, studying this question. Why are some container deposit return systems succeeding while others are failing? What are those success factors that set apart the leaders from the laggards? Um, and we found, next slide, that in general, um, the high performing systems uh, prioritize four principles to frame their program. Those principles are performance, convenience, producer responsibility, and system integrity. Um, if you're following along at home, you know that we published a white paper earlier this year, which goes into detail into these principles. We shared dozens of case studies, which illustrate how the high performers, uh, you know, place these principles into practice. Um, and then we had a webinar, which touches on all of them at a high level. I encourage you to, to check that one out. That's on timber.com as well. Um, but today we're really just going to zero in on the principle of convenience because it's so critical to the success of a deposit system. Uh, you can place a deposit, even a meaningful deposit, on a container, but if the public doesn't have a uh, convenient place to return the container and get their money back, then it's less likely they're going to participate, and the evidence uh, proves that. Um, so we wanted to illustrate how different systems uh, uh, go at this convenience challenge, what are the different options out there, what, which one is more effective, um, and we get a lot of questions about it. Um, so we figured this was a good venue for doing that. It's just the start to a conversation is not the end. Um, 
and from here, I'm sure Filippo and Katrine will, will be able to take it away. So Filippo, um, I'll stop talking here. I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague here. I'm sure he's gonna wow you with his insights and his uh, Italian accent. Filippo. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks for kicking this off and you know setting the scene for this exciting uh, webinar. Well, before, next slide, please. Before we start you know, with our journey uh, into the, the term convenience in deposit systems, I would really like to start by defining what do we mean with, with that word. So how does it couple actually with a well-structured and high-performing deposit system? So next slide, please. So basically, convenience in a deposit system makes container return easy for the original consumer. And by original consumer, we mean uh, the consumer or the family that actually bought the container in the first place. So as Mike was saying, uh, a meaningful deposit value is extremely important, you know, to drive very high collection rates. But that's not enough. We definitely need a well-structured convenient network for the return of the containers. Uh, and these two things go actually hand in hand. And while they're together, of course, the recycling, the collection rates, and then the recycling rates will be higher. So therefore, we need an easy return for the consumers. And by easy return, we mean the process has to be straightforward. Um, and potentially, if possible, also supported by technology, if also appropriate. At the same time, uh, the return has to be accessible. And that means that, uh, of course, the points of return have to be nearby to the consumers. Uh, alongside, they have to be also available. That means that they should have set open hours, for instance. Last but not least, uh, the deposit repayment should be immediate. Uh, consumers don't have to wait multiple days to recoup their uh, deposit money. So all in all, we believe that returning the container should be as easy as purchasing the container in the first place. Next slide, please. So in order to measure, uh, of course, the convenience of the system, uh, we decided to take a closer look at the um, return points which are available to the consumers. I don't know if the slide now went on. I don't have it in front of me. So next slide, please. I guess it will come. Anyway, the point is that we, of course, need to uh, give the consumers uh, the possibility to redeem their containers. And the fact that um, there is, of course, a ratio which should be calculate, calculated in order to understand the um, availability of these return points. I don't see if there is a problem. I understand we are not advancing with the slides. I hope you're bearing with me now. All right, we went a bit ahead. Can we go one slide before, please? All right, that's great. Thank you so much. So going back to the measurement you know, of the return points, um, here on this map, you can see the high performing systems. So you have Norway, Lithuania, Germany, and Michigan. Alongside for comparison purposes, we decided also to include California. California is a suboptimal system, as you will see. Um, so in order to measure uh, you know, the convenience of the system, we decided to take a closer look at the return points available per person. So as you can see, these high performing systems are uh, giving your consumers one return point per every 355 up to 1,200 people. Uh, and this is actually driving the return rates. As you can see, we have return rates of 90% and more. Uh, at the same time, California has one return point per every 32,000 people. And it's not surprising that there is a stagnant 62% return rate. Well, this is the price of inconvenience, unfortunately. Uh, in California, the consumers are not encouraged to participate in the system, and therefore they might uh, dispose their beverage containers in the wrong way, uh, throwing them away or even littering them and creating additional plastic pollution, for instance. Uh, so therefore, unfortunately, in California, the uh, deposit has become a tax. Next slide, please. Now, of course, we have also to take into consideration different aspects, such as, for instance, while developing the system, the differences between the urban and the rural areas. Uh, of course, in a low densely populated area, 
one return point might be enough. Uh, but if you move to the cities, the towns, or even the capitals, of course, uh, the features have to be different. The return network has to be structured in a different way. In, in a different way. And therefore, if you look at the number of return locations per square kilometer across Norway, you will see that there is a 0 0.3. While, of course, in Oslo, it goes up to 11. There is even a difference between the urban areas and the suburban areas, for instance. In certain low-income urban areas, uh, there might be fewer retailers participating in the system. And therefore, the residents might need to travel, um, often by public transportation, to the outskirts of the city, to the big stores actually located in the suburban areas, to get their deposit back. Well, of course, the system would need to provide all the consumers with the same opportunities and therefore with the same network uh, of return. And this would, of course, create a level playing field. Next slide, please. Now, also the type of collection, the method of collection is extremely important. From what we know, automated return points are actually collecting uh, the biggest volumes of the of the beverage containers here we have again uh, an example from norway where the automated return points make up only 23 percent of the 15,000 uh, that there are available but these collect actually 93 percent of the total volume and these numbers are also similar in in other countries such as for instance lithuania uh, that, that shows us that really the big stores which are actually operating uh, you know the hardware the te technology to take back are actually collecting uh, the biggest volumes next slide please now, we, of course, need to take into consideration the convenience of the consumers, but at the same time, cost efficiency aspects have to be included in the discussion. And from what we've understood throughout our analysis is that there is a direct correlation between uh, the costs of the system, the overall cost of the system, and the availability, or let's say, the distance between the point of return and the point of compaction of a beverage container. So compaction is key for, you know, keeping the costs lower in the system. Because, of course, compaction means uh, less travel, uh, optimizing, you know, the storage spaces, optimizing the logistics, and, of course, also reducing the emissions and the greenhouse gases which are created by, by these transports. The German grocer uh, discounter Lidl uh, showed that um, one truck could fit actually 400,000 compressed, compacted, one-way PT bottles. While if these bottles were not compacted, the same truck could only fit 1,500. And this would then, of course, result in 26 travels more, so 26 trucks more on the road and additional uh, pollution, air pollution, and, of course, damages to the environment. Of course, a compacted container cannot can also not be redeemed twice and therefore there are also benefits when it comes to combating the fraud within the system of course uh, some modeling from uh, the drs in quebec showed that the transport costs in a system with manual collection would be even four times higher compared to the costs of a system with automated and compaction process embedded uh, in itself next slide please so now we have, of course, put, you know, the cornerstones of the discussion, the definition of convenience, but how do actually system designers include these considerations while designing the system? Uh, how do they balance off these elements uh, with, of course, the cost efficiency of the system? So let's take a closer look at uh, the three different uh, return models. Next slide, please. So the, the three different models that we have are, well, the First of all, the so-called return to retail. Mike was mentioning it before. Uh, the return to retail uh, model basically provides that retailers that are selling the beverage containers are also obliged to take them back. And uh, this model, the return of the beverage containers is actually paid to the retailers by the beverage industry. Uh, this model is extremely popular in Europe and uh, also in other high-performing systems elsewhere. Um, the second option, the second return method, is the so-called return to depot or return to redemption center, where there are dedicated drop-off sites or even standalone collection points, which are actually collecting the beverage containers. Uh, also, in this case, these depots are usually 
uh, supported by a handling fee, which is paid by the beverage industry. And this model is most common in Australia. Last but not least, there is also the hybrid model, uh, which is common in the United States of America, where there are, of course, the redemption centers for the high volume redeemers. But at the same time, there is also the retail infrastructure that is taking back the used beverage containers. So while designing the system, it is extremely important in order to drive up uh, the collection rates, uh, either to include the return to retail or let's say the obligation for the retailers to take back or to include some prerequisites, like in the case of New South Wales in Australia, where the network operator has to provide the consumers with at least you know, one point per a certain number of uh, consumers in order really to increase the convenience of the system. Next slide, please. Now, here you can see also from you know, a graphic uh, perspective, uh, the comparison between the two systems that we just discussed. So on the left-hand side, you can see the return to retail model in Detroit, Michigan. And on the right-hand side, there is the case of St. John's in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. Well, on the left-hand side, you can see from the map of uh, Detroit that the return facilities are basically located at e every single corner of, of the streets, of course. Uh, this is using the return to retail model and the consumers are actually motivated to participate in the system because of a meaningful deposit value of 10 US cents. On the right hand side, um, again, the return to depot, uh, you see that there is one uh, um, depot which is available for 12,000 people. Of course, uh, the fact that this depot is not really located centrally and that you know the consumers have to drive out of their way in order to go there on purpose to bring back their containers is creating some inconveniences for them. Of course, this coupled with a deposit value which is lower, compared to, uh, to the case of Michigan, is not really encouraging the consumers to participate. And therefore, there is a return rate of uh, 69%. Next slide, please. So from our analysis, what we have discovered, and Mike was actually anticipating this, is that nine out of 10 of the world's highest performing systems are actually uh, operating a return to return model. And this is bringing an average return rate of 92%. Well, that's quite understandable because of course the retailers are placing their stores strategically because of course they need to maximize their sales and they of course need to maximize the convenience of the consumers. So leveraging on this uh, infrastructure will make again buying you know returning the container as easy as buying it in the first place uh, even in a remote mountain village or on a small island as long as there is a community there will be a store uh, that sells food and beverages and therefore there will be also the opportunity to return the containers next slide please now from the consumer's perspective we decided to make a quick summary and see what are actually the benefits Again, uh, the return to retail method is making uh, returning the containers as easy as buying them in the first place. Because, of course, again, uh, the strategic positioning of the retailers is extremely important. And the accessibility of these return locations uh, should also be uh, taken into consideration, of course. At the same time, we know that consumers are actually visiting the grocery stores more times a week in some cases, like in the US, more than three times a week. And going there and coupling, of course, the action of bringing back the containers while shopping will eliminate additional travel time for the consumers, will make it more convenient. Last but not least, there is, of course, the ability to redeem and to capture the beverage containers on the go. Uh, we know that especially in the warm months, uh, the consumers are drinking their beverages on the go while, you know, being traveling, for instance. And of course, having such a well-developed network of retailers with set open hours will facilitate the action of returning the containers to the consumers, from the consumers. Next slide, please. So, as we said, uh, deposit return systems are very interesting ecosystems which are seeing the participation of many stakeholders. So we would like now to take a look from the different perspectives, starting by you know, government. Uh, why is it so important also from the government perspective? Well, it's a winning 
policy project. It's a winner because it allows to achieve extremely high return rates, uh, collection targets, uh, recycling targets. And of course, uh, it's a real and concrete example of circular economy. It's facilitating the transition to the circular economy. It's bringing convenience to the consumers. The consumers are satisfied with the systems. And at the same time, it's bringing immediate results. And here we would like quickly to flag the case of Lithuania, for instance. Before the introduction of the deposit system in 2016, Lithuania was collecting 32% of the beverage containers put to market. Two years after the introduction of the system, this rate actually climbed at more than 90%. So you can really see the immediate results. From a producer's perspective, it's uh, the most cost efficient way to hit the targets. And we know, especially in Europe, there are targets related to collection, but also to recycling content, for instance. And therefore, the producers can really leverage on an existing network. And this would allow them really to hit their target in the most cost efficient way. Last but not least, for the retailers, it's an opportunity. This will increase the food traffic and the spending. From the analysis that we've seen, the consumers usually spend their deposit money while shopping for groceries, for instance. And of course, the retailers are providing a tremendous public service in this. And for that, they will be compensated in the high-performing systems. They're compensated by the handling fee. Uh, at the same time, the retailers in some cases, in many cases, are also producers of white brands, for instance, and therefore they also have to apply the perspective of the producers in this case. Last but not least, the environmental footprint, the environmental benefits and the brand image would, of course, uh, benefit from the return to retail approach. So if I can leave you with three main points, you know, some summarizing up my intervention, these would be uh, a deposit system, a well-developed deposit system, maximizes the collection, maximizes the recycling, and is a concrete element for the transition to a circular economy. Secondly, extremely important, the deposit value goes hand in hand, the meaningful deposit value goes hand in hand with the return network, which is extremely important to drive up the collection rate. Last but not least, the return to retail model is effective, uh, brings the highest collection rates and also the highest convenience to the consumers. This being said, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Katrin. Katrin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo. <laughs> um, yeah, so now we have established uh, why it's important to have a collection network that is accessible for the consumers and that return to retail makes this. It's also important to make sure that the return itself at the collection point is easy. And this is what we will look into now. So jump two slides, I think. <laughs> Thank you. So I will guide you through the range of different return solutions that systems designers are using in new and modernized deposit systems to make the return easy and the use of technology and all of these. I will first present automated return and then manual return, which is the most commonly used return solutions that we see in well-performing deposit systems. But I will also touch on two other return solutions that uh, is also seen in markets, uh, which are backdrop and door-to-door -door solution. Next slide, please. When public deposit return systems first launched in the 1970s, consumers had to rely on pure manual return, meaning they handed the containers over to store staff to be counted one by one, and then the store staff had to keep track of the accounting by hand. In 1972, the two brothers that you see in the picture, Thomas Founders, was contacted by a local grocery store in Norway because they were having trouble managing all of these containers that they got returned to them. The result was that they invented the very first fully automated reverse vending machine. Reverse vending machine can also be called RVM in short, by the way. This made handling the return containers much more easy for the store but also for the consumers and actually the system as such. And it added a number of new benefits that increased the system's integrity and cost efficiency. 
Next slide. Looking at it from the consumer's perspective, well, they didn't have to wait anymore for the staff to be available to come and count um, the containers. And they didn't have to wait for them to count them one by one. The RVMs are designed to be easy to use for everyone. And also you can trust that it accurately counts the deposit that is being refunded. And technology is always advancing. The latest platforms are able to process 60 containers a minute. That is one bottle a second. And I don't know about you guys, but it's much quicker than what Amitly is able to do. So it's just an example of how technology exceeds what the human capabilities are able to do. Next slide, please. I wanted to use the opportunity to explain to you what are the basics of a reverse winning machine. What does it actually do and what type of services do it provide to different key stakeholders in a well-performing DRS? Well, I touched a little bit on the first point. It provides an intuitive user journey. It shows the consumer how many containers they have returned, the type of containers, how many pet bottles, how many cans, and it prints out a receipt um, that can be redeemed with a refund at the checkout. But then past that point, it's so much more to it. Well, the machine, it verifies that what is being inserted into the machine is actually a container that is covered within the deposit system and that it is a container and not something different. It checks the barcode, it checks the weight, it checks the shape of it and also prevents fraud attempts. And it makes sure that the refund that is being paid out is the correct refund. So there is a lot of data that is being processed. Um, for instance, the machine is connected online and reporting to the system operator the number of containers collected down to each barcode level and also the refund values um, that has been paid out. All of these data is amounts to quite significant sums of money actually. So it's important also that this data is managed in a secure way. Lastly, the machine can also sort and process the um, collected containers. You can sort it according to material type. So separating cans from pet bottles and then compacting them. Felipe also touched on this and um, the benefits of compacting the bottles at the collection point is that you reduce the volume for storage and also optimize for the logistics, as well as preventing that anyone can reinsert the container that has already been paid refund for. Next slide, please. Well, you can think of the elements that I just presented as the core of a reverse winding machine. But technology has advanced as well and can be used to engage consumers because motivating consumers is key if we're going to get them to bring every container back. So great recycling experiences is important and technological innovations should do just that. Next slide. Mobile applications. They can be integrated into deposit systems through partnerships with brand owners, um, retailers, system operators, or other collection point operators such as uh, bulk, uh, such as depots, I mean. And it makes the recycling journey easy and attractive for the consumers. It can include information on where to return the containers. You can link it to a loyalty program, you can have digital vouchers instead of the printed paper vouchers, which creates a more environmentally um, beneficial solution. And you can even create gamifications. So letting the consumers get achievements the more they recycle, giving them a pat on the back for the good job that they're doing. Next slide, please. Another example of technology advancements are the new multi-feed reverse winding machines. They allow consumers to empty an entire bag of containers into the machine at once. Just have a look at this video on how it works. A 
it's cool, isn't it? Well, the consumer feedback is, has been great on it, and I'll come back to that in a short minute. So technology players are always looking for ways to make the container return experience even more engaging for the consumers. And I, went, I also wanted to bring up an example um, where Tomra has now also trialing a concept that is called Express Mode, which allows consumers to identify themselves with the app at the machine, then simply pour the containers into the machine, close a lid and walk away. They go shopping while the machine is doing the processing. And once, they, um, once the processing is done, the refund will be transferred via digital voucher through the app. So when they go to pay for the groceries, they can also redeem the refund. This is a solution where you have combined both digital tools with this multi-feed reverse vending machine. And I would say, you know, it's the self-driving car of container recycling. It's hands-free, mess-free, and weight-free. Next slide. And it's not only the consumers, they say that they prefer this type of solution. They also prove it in the way that they act. Um, I just want to say first that the stats that I'm going to provide to you now is without the express mode. Um, it's the, the way that the machine works in the video as you saw it. So kind of the standard mode that these data represent. So we have looked into the data uh, of the Tomra R1, which is our multi-feed RVM, looking across the retailers that have these machines, they have actually seen a doubling of their volume in average. They doubled. And it's not only the volumes that increase, it's also the number of consumers coming to the store. So they have an average seen an increase of 40%. So this is comparing the data before they installed the machine and then looking at them one year later. If we look at the retailer with the highest increase, they have achieved four times as many bottles as before they had the machine. And they have three times as many consumers returning them. And we do also see that the numbers continue to increase after the first year. And one of the retailers told us that he has customers driving 45 minutes just to get to his store to return containers because of the machine. And then they do their shopping there as well. The figures are from Norway, Sweden, and Finland, by the way. Next slide, please. So I've covered automated return. So let's look into the other common return solution, which is manual return. Because manual return is a natural part of a collection network. In a deposit system where anyone who sells beverage containers are obliged to also take them back, this will also include small shops and kiosks. And they will typically get quite low volumes returned back to them and offer them manual return solution. In well-functioning deposit return systems, all containers collected manually in the system is processed through automated equipment. This is standard procedure in most uh, deposit return systems. It allows the system to have full control of the containers collected in the system. It is reported online. They have the transparency of what is collected and recon reconciled those data versus what is actually being sold to the market as well. And um, the benefits are basically the same as with the consumer facing RVM that I presented earlier. So the technology behind is called industrial reverse winding solution, bulk counting equipment. So this industrial reverse winding solution, it processes large quantities of containers in bulk. The main difference between this technology and the consumer facing RVM is that it is designed to be used at counting centers and it is, used, uh, it is designed to be operated by trained staff. Next slide, please. 
moving over to those two solutions that might be um, not that common, uh, but, but we still see them in many markets. So first off is Bagdrop. Bagdrop is also enabled through the use of bull counting equipment like manual return. It is a very convenient way for consumers to return containers quickly. And it could work typically in this way. So the consumers, they register with an account, put all of the containers in a bag and attach a sticker to it. This sticker has a barcode, which is linking the bag to that consumer. Arriving to the drop-off location, they scan the barcode and then drop the bag in the chute. In the back end, it is bull counting equipment that is processing, checking, validating the containers before um, the refund is transferred to the user account. This typically takes between two to 10 business days. So it means that even though this is a solution that is very convenient for some, it might not be the right solution for someone in need of the money immediately. And it does also come with some additional costs because there is an increased risk of fraud. And there is also a risk that there is unwanted items in the bag, simply non-beverage containers. You could also experience uh, customer complaints on the counting results just simply because they thought that uh, they handed in more containers than they actually did. And someone has to pay for all of these costs, including for the processing as well. And it's often passed on to the consumer. In the Oregon system, Bagdrop is included as a service and their customers, they pay 40 US cents as a fee per bag to cover these costs, or at least parts of these costs. It is more common at depots rather than retailers. And that is because at depots, you might have also these bull counting equipment serving as a counting center as well. So if you have co-located the drop-off location with the processing of the containers, you will typically not do that at a retailer because it would be um, quite, it would require a lot of space and it would also, to drive the efficiency, you also would like to have a lot of volumes. So by having it at a retailer, it would mean that you would have to store a lot of air because it would be uncompacted containers and you would also have to transport a lot of air. So you drive down the cost efficiency and the environmental benefits of that solution. Also, it's often a promised payout time window. So let's say that the service provider has promised the consumers to pay out within three business days. That means that at latest after two days, they have to transport a bag from the retailer to the counting center, regardless of how many bags has been returned to that retailer. It could be two bags, it could be a hundred bags. So you do have a risk of trucks, uh, trucks going with very low volumes, again, driving down the environmental benefits and the efficiency. Next slide, please. Lastly, we have door, door solutions. So retailers, technology players, and system operators are collaborating to provide pickup services right at the consumer's doorstep. In Norway, the central system administrator Infinitim has partnered up with the online retailer Oda, previously called Colonial, to offer a service where Oda's grocery delivery team picks up containers at the same time as they drop off the groceries. So the customers, they buy special bags that have a barcode on them. And when the driver picks up that bag, he scans the barcode linking the bag to that consumer. In the end, that bag is transported to one of Infinitum's centralized counting centers, being processed through bull counting equipment, the same way as manually collected containers are processed. So once the verification is done, the refund amount is transferred to the customer account. It is becoming a quite popular uh, solution for online retailers. However, like in Norway, it is currently operating on a quite low scale. So in Norway, it is less than 1% of all containers collected in the system that is captured through online retailers. But it is a nice way for online retailers to attract customers to them 
and also to meet potential um, return obligations. In Scotland's to be launched system, online retailers, just like brick and mortar retailers, are obliged to provide return solutions. And also with the global increase of or the, the, yeah, the global increase of um, the use of online retailers, especially during the pandemic, there is a need to, to look for solutions like this. This is all I had to share with you guys today. To summarize it, if we're going to collect every single container that is put on the market and to drive the environmental benefits that it can give, it's so important that the return experience for the consumers are easy but also that return is made easy for the other key stakeholders in the system. By using technology, you are achieving this. And you're not only achieving convenience, but you're also increasing the system's integrity and cost efficiency. And with that, I would like to hand it back to you, Mike. Excellent. Thank you, Katrine. You can go to the next slide there. All right, great, everyone. Uh, one, one slide back where we have the three points there. Um, right, so what did we learn? Um, we talked a lot about convenience, but if you take nothing away from this talk, then uh, here's our three takeaways. Convenience in a deposit system means redemption or container return is easy, it's accessible, and immediate refund options are available. Um, the highest performing deposit systems choose what is known as a return to retail model and new redemption technology is always coming online to improve uh, the container return experience, making it convenient. Uh, these include multi-feed RBMs, bag drop, um, and door-to-door -door redemption. Um, with that, um, I will turn just into the next slide where we're just do a, a quick reminder about our white paper. Um, this is what I mentioned earlier on. We dive into these concepts and more. You can find this white paper at tamra.com slash deposit return. Uh, we also have a webinar which kind of provides an executive summary of that white paper in short form in case you don't feel like reading 70 pages. Um, so we cover the best practices of deposit systems there, including dozens of case studies. Uh, next slide, please. We have about 12 minutes for questions. Um, and we did get quite a bit in here, um, so we'll answer as many as we can in the time that's left. First one that came in, um, with forthcoming US plastic recycling legislation requiring manufacturers to include a certain percentage of recycled material, there is a concern of adequately available recycled materials to use. Do you foresee more of these collection systems being implemented to attain the additional recycled resources? Um, sure, and there's some, some talk about this. Um, there's, I know California and uh, Washington State, for example, passed recycled content mandates for plastic beverage containers. Um, and uh, NAPCOR did an interesting analysis, the PET Trade Association here in, in the US, where it said if the country were to reach a 50% recycled content level for all the beverage containers sold in the country, in the US, um, then the recycling rate for PET containers, uh, beverage containers, would need to go from about 39% today to 80%. That's by 2030. Um, so that's clearly a step change in collection and, uh, and clean recycling of this material. Um, so this is raising questions about, well, how is the country going to get to that level? And remember, it's not just the collection rate, but we need to make sure that the material is preserved so it can go back into food contact uh, packaging, which is difficult uh, for some collection systems. So yes, I think there is, a, some, there is some talk about there would need to be some sort of policy change to um, reach that level of collection rates. Hopefully that answers the question. Our next question was, uh, please could you amplify about uh, collection models for on-the-go redemption? Um, I don't think I understood the explanation. Philippe, I, I recall you mentioning on-the-go. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, the on-the-go consumption is, of course, on the rise, and this is something that we have observed um, 
since many many years uh, the return to rate and the return to retail model allows of course the consumers to bring back uh, the containers which are consumed on the go in a very convenient way and this is just because of the dense and well structured return infrastructure that uh, there is uh, as you remember maybe the map of Michigan of Detroit you could see really that the return points were actually located almost at every single corner of the street and therefore the consumers really have the opportunity to bring back uh, immediately the container and get their deposit back without waiting. I hope this answers the question. Okay, um, great. Third question. This is all interesting, but perhaps a focus on single use and maybe even incentivizing single use containers. What do you have to reinforce the refillables market, which must be the ultimate goal? Um, yeah, and I think it's important to focus like, yes, th this uh, was designed on uh, single use containers, but deposit systems are uh, somewhat similar for the refillables market. In Europe, it's still common to have a refillables system where people will return their containers, their refillable containers to RVMs. RVMs are capable of taking back refillables where the beverage industry cleans them and puts them back out um, to be reused again and again. Um, so they can very much be used as a system to piggyback or leapfrog from single use to refillables. Um, in some ways, it's seen that the uh, deposit systems for single use can be kind of a transition to a refillable system. We see this in Oregon uh, a bit now where there's a deposit system for single use containers and then the beverage industry organized to also uh, overlay that with a refillable um, beverage system, I believe just for beer, but on a statewide basis. So it helps to um, put forward a cost efficient way for the industry to move towards refillables. From a policy perspective, there's some talk about setting recycling qu uh, refillables quotas or a certain percentage of beverage containers need to be sold that are in reusable packaging. Um, and to reach those reusable collection rates, uh, deposit system would probably be required. Um, so that's just some of the ways that um, single use and refillables containers can kind of work in tandem. What else do we have here? Uh, one about the tech. Um, are, are there machines that can take all types of containers in one glass, metal, plastic in the same machine? Uh, Katrine, um, if you want to take that. Sure, I talked about machines, so naturally. Um, yes, that's the simple answer. Uh, there are machines that can take uh, plastic uh, bottles, um, cans and glass, uh, even both one-way glass and refillable glass. And uh, you can choose also if you want to keep all those materials separated, but some of them are also possible to uh, commingle. It also depends whether you choose to compact or not um, the containers that is processed through the machines. But the machines come in all ranges. Hope that mm -hmm. answers it. Okay. And Filippo, was there anything you wanted to add about, I'm, I'm remembering now that Germany has a refillables market. Was there, was there something you wanted to add about that? Yeah, Germany has a refillable market. Uh, it's a quite big one. And uh, of course, what you were saying, it's about, you know, the relationship between the refillable market and the single use market is that the two systems actually should go hand in hand. And uh, the, 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 basically the introduction of the deposit system in Germany in the early 2000s actually supported the stabilization of the refillable market, which was diminishing actually over the last years. So therefore there is of course an interrelation. And from our history, Tom actually comes from the refillable market as you could hear from from Katrin the, the first machine was actually invented in 72 in order to support the refillable sector there you go um, next question is about I see how forcing retailers to accept containers can be convenient for the consumer um, but this can be a significant burden for retailers how is this addressed in legislation or system design uh, Filippo how about you take that of course, of course, I was talking about the return to retail model, so it's natural I take it. So as said, um, the, the work of the retailers in the return to retail model is a tremendous uh, public service to the community because really they are supporting the shift towards circular economy and therefore they should be compensated through the handling fee. And this is actually happening in the high performing markets where the handling fee is actually covering uh, all the direct costs which are related 
to the return process. So the handling fees covering uh, the investment, for instance, in the infrastructure, in the hardware, it's covering the utilities, uh, it's covering you know the, the operational costs, the maintenance, so basically emptying the bins, cleaning the machines. Uh, but at the same time, it also covers, for instance, the commercial space, which is of course taken away for you know installing the the, the return possibilities. Uh, therefore, what we can say is that really the handling fee is a very critical part of the whole equation. And um, again, this shows the, the public service of the uh, retailers. At the same time, in legislations, there could also be some exception, exceptions, for instance, in the return to retail obligation, like, for instance, in the case of Lithuania, uh, where stores which are smaller than 300 square meters are not obliged to take back in the urban areas. But of course, they can on a voluntary basis. So as you can see, there are different nuances which should be taken into consideration while developing the system. Great. Um, and then one about maybe maybe one or two more questions. Door-to-door uh, -door redemption looks really appealing. As the world moves to shopping from home and having groceries delivered, will return to retail become less relevant for deposit return systems? Uh, Filippo, sorry to put you on the spot again, but you want to take this? Now, of course, of course, I want to take this. Uh, well, system designers, um, while you know they develop the system, uh, need always to keep in mind the targets. So they they need really to maximize the collection. And of course, we see the rise of you know the online shopping and the online sales. Uh, but leveraging on the existing network of brick and mortar stores is extremely important. Uh, because this really represents, you know, the dense network of, of return points, which is already available. Uh, there is the case, for instance, of Scotland, where the deposit system will go live in, in the near future, uh, where basically uh, it's foreseen that whomever is selling is also obliged to take back. So if you're selling online, you should either, you know, provide the consumer with the opportunity to take back in front of your door, or you should provide the consumer with the opportunity to go to a consumer-facing physical return point in order to get back the containers and get your deposit back. Okay. Hope this answers. Sure. Um, and the return to depot model, uh, I see that that's capable of, re the return to depot model is capable of achieving higher return rates. Uh, why was there not more of a discussion on that? Um, Filippo. And yeah, well, yeah, Sh should I go first? Yeah, I will jump. Sure. So <laughs> the return to depot, of course, it's, it's an interesting model. But uh, as you could see, um, I mean, from our analysis, we saw that there are a few outliers in the return to depot environment that actually reach uh, return rates that are 85% or higher. And these are actually Palau, the small island in the Pacific with uh, 18,000 inhabitants, and Iceland with approximately more than 350,000 inhabitants. Of course, there is a uh, different uh, retail footprint. Um, and what we have to say is also that the deposit value there is quite high, for instance. In, uh, uh, in Iceland, it's 12 US cents. Um, we decided to focus on the return to retail because, of course, this brings additional benefits. Uh, like we said before, uh, the infrastructure is already there. So creating the system, it's quicker, it's more immediate. It's also more cost efficient, of course. It creates conveniences for the consumers that don't have to drive out of their way. Um, again, it brings a reduction in the emissions. So there is also the environmental aspects. And, and therefore, this is why uh, we have analyzed, of course, uh, which ones are the, the high performers ones. And uh, again, nine out of 10 uh, are actually return to retail models. Excellent. All right, well, we can bring up our last slide here to send everybody off. Um, thank you, Filippo. Thank you, Katrine. You all can take a break here. Um, thanks everyone for joining. If, you, if we didn't get to your questions, we'll endeavor to respond uh, directly. You can also reach out at any time uh, to, at govaffairs at tomer.com, this email address right here. Uh, again, the white paper is at tomer.com slash deposit return. Um, and thank you for joining. Have a great rest of your day.